This is Phil Koopman from Carnegie Mellon University, specializing in robust embedded systems. Today, I'm going to talk about embedded system software security, safety, and quality. I'll cover why it matters and what you can do to make your embedded system better, safer, and more secure. A significant challenge in creating high-quality embedded systems is that one software mistake is all that it takes to be a problem. Bad software can tarnish your brand or potentially even kill your company. Consider. Who wants to be this guy? This is the head of Volkswagen who resigned due to a scandal involving software that cheated on vehicle emissions. Now in this case, the news is reporting that this was an intentional software feature to cheat. But the fact is, some software is going to cost this company billions of dollars at the very least. A few years ago, a software problem nearly killed a company in a much more direct way. Knight Capital had a computer-based stock trading system that was misconfigured one day in August 2012. Within 45 minutes, they lost $440 million making trades with the bad software. This erased most of the company's value, and they were only saved via a private investor bailout. In this talk, I'm going to make the point that these are not isolated occurrences, but rather representative data points that show that your company is going to live or die by the quality of its software. Here's an overview of this talk. Software quality problems are pervasive throughout the embedded system industry. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to fix it now, or are you going to wait until you're on CNN? For Chrysler, it's too late. They've already been on CNN for having 1.4 million vehicles vulnerable to a remote security attack. And it turns out that was only the first chapter of their story. We'll see how they do. The fact is that your company lives or dies by its software quality. That means that the ability to create high-quality software is a core competency. It doesn't matter if your product historically had no software at all. Once you add a computer into your system, you're going to need to get your software right. That is going to take strong skills in embedded software, as well as good engineering approaches to designing and deploying your systems. Historically, many companies have tried to solve software quality problems by doing more product-level testing. That only goes so far. And ultimately, it just can't make the problem go away. Instead, you need good practices, a good development process, and good development skills. It's time to get serious about software quality, and that's going to mean you have to change your daily practices. You have to have good process support, you must make sure your people are trained up, and you need some high-level metrics to know that everything's on track. Make no mistake, getting embedded software right is challenging. But nonetheless, customers expect basically perfect embedded software. Perhaps in some cases, such as smartphone apps, you can get away with what people sometimes call good enough software. But with most embedded systems, people often don't perceive they're buying software at all, but rather a product that's just supposed to work, such as a car. So if you have a bug, they consider that unacceptable. And the next thing you know, you're a target in a class action lawsuit or something. Beyond that, once you do find a bug, it can still be super painful to deploy a software update. Let's take the example of the Ford MyTouch system. This is an infotainment system for Ford vehicles. They had issues with software glitches to the point that they ended up sending a quarter million USB flash memory sticks to customers to upgrade their cars. In other systems, software updates might take an on-site maintenance visit or a hardware replacement even. While over-the-air updates are sometimes possible, that opens up security concerns. So there is no easy fix once you ship a software defect. Beyond that, embedded systems generally have significant technical challenges that make it difficult to get things perfect. Typically, cost constraints mean limited hardware resources. But even with those constraints, the system must often meet stringent real-time deadlines to work properly. And systems must deal with interactions between non-standard sensors and actuators. On top of those challenges, a surprising amount of embedded software is mission critical. Some software is safety critical in that someone can get killed or injured if a software defect causes a problem. But beyond that, 
A mission-critical system is one in which misbehaving software can cause any kind of unacceptable loss, including a financial loss, a reputation hit, a regulatory violation, or a safety problem. So, even if your software is not safety-critical in the classical sense, understanding how software safety works can help you meet your mission-critical requirements. The first step in fixing a problem is understanding how bad the problem is. Unfortunately, some embedded system code is just pervasively bad. You might have heard of spaghetti code, which refers to software that is such a tangled mess nobody can really figure out how it works. And because of excessive complexity, it might be difficult or impossible to test thoroughly. You might also think that spaghetti code went away with the advent of structured programming techniques a couple decades ago. But as it turns out, spaghetti code is still out there in the world. Millions and millions of Toyota vehicles produced in the 2000s had spaghetti code, and many of those vehicles are still on the road today. Those aren't just my words, but rather Toyota's own words about the quality of their code. They even said internally that they had to improve the spaghetti-like status of their engine control code. Unfortunately, that engine controller was found to be the cause of a fatal car crash, leading to stories in the press saying their system had killer firmware. That's the type of press no company really wants to see. In the end, problems with unintended acceleration that involve the engine controller firmware have ended up costing the company over a billion dollars, with hundreds and hundreds of lawsuits for death and injury settling beyond that. Clearly, the quality of their embedded software has been a problem for Toyota. The problem gets even harder, though. That's because some systems have had significant issues even from seemingly tiny code problems. In fact, it can take only one single line of bad code to land your product in the news for a serious software defect. Take the case of Heartbleed. Heartbleed is the name of a vulnerability in internet software security that surfaced in 2014. It caused some really significant concerns and generated a lot of press. It was all due to one line of bad code and it reads mem copy bp pl payload. That's it. That's the bad line of code. That's what all the fuss was about. The problem is that this is a classic buffer overflow vulnerability, the type of code problem that has been known to be a security issue for a long, long time. The problem is that this line of code copies some bytes of data from one part of memory to another without checking whether too many bytes are being copied. If an attacker asks for too many bytes, that exposes information about other users' data, sometimes including other users' secret key information. So this means you could basically find out other people's secrets using this attack. In other words, one line of bad code significantly compromised the security of huge swaths of the internet. Regardless of the source of your bugs, large-scale production typical of embedded systems makes problems worse when you're shipping millions and millions of items. Every time you make a mistake, that mistake is going to show up in all of your millions of products. Let's talk about some examples. Nest thermostats are a well-known example of the so-called Internet of Things trend. One of their bugs made the news in March 2015 by getting daylight savings time wrong. But not to worry, they said, nobody was going to be left in the cold due to that bug. Being left in the cold waited a few months until January 2016. Then a Nest software bug, quote, plunges customers into the cold, unquote, as the headline says. Fortunately, Nest can remotely deploy patches in most cases. But it's not good to have a lot of press from software defects in something like a thermostat. Consider the Nest is marketed as something that just works without customers paying a lot of attention to it, not something you want software defects in. Next up is a Samsung keyboard bug that left 600 million Android devices exposed to hackers. That sounds like a serious problem. Finally, Toyota wasn't alone in unintended acceleration problems. Honda initiated recall for thousands of cars that suffered from unintended acceleration that they admitted was due to a software defect. There are just so many examples of bad software cropping up, more than there should be. Let's talk a little more about the Chrysler problem with Jeep security. Some security researchers were able to bypass security in a Jeep and remotely disable brakes of a test vehicle that was driving on the road. 
The headline is a result of the journalist having this done to him while he was actually driving a Jeep as part of writing about this story. The way they were able to disable brakes involved exploiting a problem with remote updates. Next, we have the Airbus A400M cargo plane. As you can see, it has four turboprop engines. The problem was caused by installing an incorrect software configuration in three out of the four engines on an aircraft, leading to a crash caused by bad software. These problems go far beyond transportation. In another example, hospital drug pumps were found to be insecure. Bad guys could alter limits for a drug, potentially resulting in sending a fatal drug dose to patients. Hospitals have become highly networked to provide a better information flow to caregivers, but that connectivity is coming at the cost of increased security issues. Back to the Internet of Things, there are smart light bulbs that connect to each other via Wi-Fi. But one type of bulb is vulnerable to an attack that lets bad guys steal the Wi-Fi password to a house. These types of vulnerabilities show up in the news regularly for Internet of Things devices. Security is going to be a significant challenge there. Given all these problems, hopefully it's becoming clear that these days a successful company has to recognize that it lives or dies by the quality of its software. This can be a challenge because embedded systems historically have had their production costs dominated by the electromechanical portion of the system. Consider a bill of materials cost, often called BOM cost, B-O-M. You might have a system that has 90% of its BOM cost being non-electronic hardware, such as metal and plastic parts. Next, you might have 10% of the BOM cost in the form of electronics that have been added to enable advanced functionality. Both the mechanical and electronic components are essential. But make no mistake, even though they add up to 100% of the bomb cost, without software, their product is just going to sit there and do nothing. Software, on the other hand, doesn't really cost extra to deploy in each additional unit made. So it is 0% of the bomb cost. Sure, software can be expensive to create, but it's seen as a one-time cost more like tooling and not a bomb cost. The dysfunction that often results is that software is seen as free because it has zero bomb cost. That's free. That means that inappropriate trade-offs might be made, such as specifying a CPU that is too slow and too small just to save bomb cost. But that comes at the expense of potentially making it impossible for the software developers to produce high quality software. To get good software, management attention has to wake up to the fact that software needs to be treated as a first class citizen. Despite it being historically valued at zero in terms of bomb cost accounting, software makes or breaks your products. In some companies, this change to software as a first class citizen is going to require dramatic cultural change. The usual approach when there are software quality problems is to say, well, let's do more product testing because for sure that will get rid of all those pesky bugs. That approach pretty much never really works. The reason is that testing bad software simply makes it less bad. But in most embedded systems, you don't want less bad software. You actually want good software. And testing on its own cannot produce good software. People have known for a long time that you can't test in quality. So why are they still trying to do it for software quality? The reason for the ineffectiveness of trying to test in software perfection is fundamental. There are simply too many things you have to test, and it is infeasible to cover all the possible timing and sequencing problems, all the operational scenarios, and all the failure types that your software is going to see in the field. As an example of just how ineffective product testing can be, a study from IBM found that even with generally high software quality, one third of faults took more than 5,000 years of product exposure to find. So this meant that if you had one copy of the system and ran it for 5,000 years, or 5,000 copies for one year, or 60,000 copies of the system run for a month, 
you'd still miss a third of the bugs. The problem is one of deployment scale. When you deploy thousands or millions of systems, your customers are going to see those 5,000 year bugs on a regular basis. But you have basically no chance of finding them in testing because you simply cannot test that much. Thus, you need to do something more than testing to achieve reasonable software quality for widely deployed systems. Let's talk about how bad it could possibly be for your product. Consider, what is the worst possible outcome for a software bug in your product? Is it a safety problem where someone can be killed or injured? Can a software failure cause property damage? Even if the failure doesn't cause harm, could the cost of a recall or fix be significant? Or maybe you're just worried about brand reputation. In my research, I deal with autonomous systems, so a lot of times the worst case for us is in fact that you might be killed by some sort of robot. But even if your system isn't that safety critical, there may be mission critical considerations that make it essential that your software works properly all the time, not just most of the time. Now consider what the worst possible outcome is for a malicious attacker. Is it the same as for a software bug? It should be. The reason that both malicious and non-malicious outcomes are comparable is that in principle, buggy software or malicious software can have the same bad effect. Safety involves making sure that accidental defects don't cause bad outcomes. Security involves making sure that malicious attacks can't cause bad outcomes. But in the end, they both are concerned with figuring out what bad results could occur due to a software problem and avoiding them. It is likely that regulation for mission-critical properties will increase over time. We already see that the IEC 60730 safety standard is mandated in Europe for appliances. Additionally, there is a proliferation of security standards and proposed security best practice guidelines across many embedded system areas. So in the near future, there will be increased pressure to get both safety and security right. Let's talk about designing for safety. A key concept in designing for safety is that every system is assumed to be unsafe by default. In other words, system designers must assume that each system is unsafe, and then it's their responsibility to proactively show that the system is safe. That means you can't just assume it's safe because you haven't seen a problem. Rather, you have to actually prove that you're safe. This is a well-established principle. One convenient place to read more about this accepted approach to safety is DEFSTAN 00-55, which is a UK Ministry of Defense standard that is easily accessible on the web. In general, the process of arguing safety involves four main steps. First, you ask what can go wrong, and what does safe really mean anyway, and you write this down. Next, you assign severity to each risk, which gives you what types of mishaps or bad outcomes are most important to avoid. Third, you perform risk mitigation to avoid hazards and activation of these hazards. Finally, you address residual hazards by developing software with an acceptable level of integrity to ensure that no safety-relevant defects remain in the software when it is deployed. As part of this, you demonstrate that the software works properly via testing, but testing is considered a final check rather than the main risk reduction activity. Let's go over the steps in more detail. The first step is to identify and assess the risks. There are two pieces to this. The first step is to create a hazard log. That's simply a list of all the hazards for your project. The list can be started by using hazards from previous similar projects. It can be expanded via a structured analysis technique called HAZOP, which involves modifying the requirements with guide words to see what happens if things go in an unexpected way. It can also be expanded via project experience and in fact is a living document that is updated over the course of the life of the product. The result is a list of hazards that might be a problem. Once the list of hazards has been collected, a preliminary hazard analysis or PHA is performed. This usually involves using a risk table. Here's an example risk table. In this table, the rows correspond to the consequence severity if a problem does occur. While this risk table is generic, 
It's better make the consequence more concrete in a way that specifically relates to your project. For example, you might decide that a very high consequence is a $100 million loss, and a very low consequence is only a $100 loss that happens once in a while across the entire product fleet. The columns correspond to probability. Again, it is helpful to make the probability more concrete for your project. For example, very high might be something that happens every minute somewhere in your product fleet, and very low might be something that happens only once every 10 years across all the systems you've shipped. For each hazard, you determine consequence and probability, which gives you a square inside the grid. The square tells you the risk, which can range from the very low green squares to the very high red squares. Generally, you need to mitigate all the very high risks at least, usually the high risks, and so on. By the time you get to the very low risks, probably you can simply accept them because they're very rare events that basically have very little impact. Note that each risk has a number from 0 through 4 associated with it. That corresponds to a SIL, as we'll see on the next slide. Once the risk table has been used to determine severity, safety standards usually convert that risk to a SIL to determine the level of engineering rigor that should be applied. A SIL is a safety integrity level. SILs are generally divided up into a handful of bins, where usually the highest risk is called SIL 4, which is considered catastrophic. In many systems, this corresponds to a large fatal event, such as a severe train crash involving multiple fatalities that could result from a software defect. Lower SILs correspond to lower levels of risk that might, for example, involve only injuries. The idea is that the higher the SIL, the more engineering rigor needs to be applied. As an example, let's consider IEC 61508, which is a software safety standard used in the chemical process industry. That standard uses SIL 1 as low risk and SIL 4 as a very high risk. It then shows how to mitigate risk by applying engineering rigor. A small subset of the techniques required by the standard are shown in this table. You can see many different software techniques in the rows, with four columns corresponding to the four SILs used by the standard, SIL 1 through SIL 4 highlighted in yellow. For SIL 1, you can see that some techniques are recommended, which means they are nice to do, but not strictly required. One technique using structured methods is highly recommended, which as a practical matter means you have to do it for safety even at SIL 1. At SIL 2, some more techniques are recommended, and dynamic techniques are not recommended, which means you should not use them. That's because if the system changes during runtime, the system that's running isn't the same one that was tested, so it's hard to know how it will behave. At SIL 3, which is considered life critical, four more techniques become highly recommended. At SIL 4, even more techniques are highly recommended, causing the application of even more engineering rigor. There are many pages of tables like this in this standard, but the general idea is that safety standards enumerate techniques to ensure that high SIL software is essentially free of mission-critical defects. The higher the SIL, the more engineering effort must be applied to make sure that nothing slips through into a deployed system. With the emphasis on ensuring the quality of software for mission-critical systems, you might think that significant effort would be required on testing. And you'd be right. What we've seen in successful, high-quality embedded software is that teams have one tester for every designer. But that doesn't mean simply testing the code into submission. Rather, good software comes from a balance of design and testing effort. To understand how this works, let's take a look at the V-Development model, which is commonly used for mission-critical embedded software. Here, we see the version of the V referenced in the IEC 6730 Appliance Safety Standard. Development activities go down the left side of the V, from requirements through design to code. Testing goes up the right side of the V. In general, designers tend to do the left side of the V. And testers tend to do the right side of the V. Testing thoroughly requires a significant amount of testing. However, 
Attempting to improve mission-critical software quality by simply adding more and more testers runs out of steam very quickly. What you want to do is maintain a balance between testers and developers. Too few testers and you have a problem. Too many testers and it's probably more expensive than getting the same or better quality by adding more developers and having them do better quality practices. Developers use a methodical engineering approach to avoid inserting defects into the code in the first place. Testers act as a check and balance to ensure the code starts out with high quality and to filter out the remaining few bugs that might crop up so that the product that ships is essentially critical bug free. Something we often see is that testers are held responsible for quality. But that's nonsense. Testers aren't writing the code. Designers put the quality in, and testers make sure the quality is there. It has to be a team effort. If designers aren't doing system testing, how is it that they're finding or removing defects before the testers even get a chance to see the code? The answer is, they're doing a lot more than simply slopping down lines of code in a text editor. They're doing careful design, and most importantly, they're doing peer reviews to find defects before the design and code are released to testing. Peer reviews involve a team of two or three peer programmers sitting down and taking a look at the code. The gold standard for this process is called a Fagan-style inspection. It involves a pre-review meeting for everyone to get oriented, a formal sit-down in-person review meeting, a written report, and potentially a reinspection if too many defects are found. A significant lesson learned in the past couple decades is that the more formal the review, the higher the payoff. By this, I mean not only that more bugs are found, but also that the number of bugs found per dollar is higher by using formal reviews than by using informal reviews. In fact, formal, careful reviews find 50% of the defects for only about 10% of the project cost. How can reviews be this effective and this cheap? The key is that defects are found early before it's even possible to test the code. That means that each bug is less disruptive and can be fixed before any time is spent on testing. Also, reviewers can read code more than 100 times faster than the total cost to write the code, so it makes sense that the review is a small fraction of the total effort. Once you've seen the data, it's puzzling why so many designers say they don't have time to do peer reviews. I guess it's because they're too busy writing more bugs to meet a code complete deadline. As you've probably seen, that approach often results in a project where writing the code, as they say, takes the first 90% of the project, and the joke is, debugging takes the other 90% of the project. But because testing can't be complete, if you send buggy code to testing, the product you ship is simply less buggy rather than high quality software. To be sure, there are other technical issues that developers must address, but to achieve high quality software, doing careful peer reviews on every line of code written has to be the number one developer priority. And for those of you using an agile process, the picture gets drawn a bit differently, but in the end, you still need about equal staffing for development functions and test functions to get good embedded software. In addition to safety, security also matters for industrial systems. In fact, attacks can be far worse for industrial embedded systems because the results can affect the physical world. For example, in 2014, an attack on a steel mill in Germany caused massive damage due to an uncontrolled shutdown. As another example, in January 2016, an attack on western Ukraine cut their power grid. Data indicates that attacks against embedded control SCADA systems are rapidly increasing. Something to note in this chart is that almost 26% of the attacks were buffer overflow attacks in the vein of what we saw earlier for the Heartbleed attack. In contrast, less than 6% of the attacks were due to cryptographic issues. That means that, while cryptography is important for security, the problems in practice often relate more to bad code quality or bad security practices than to actual problems with the crypto itself. For example, 
Both the steel mill and the power grid attacks we just discussed involved malicious email links being clicked by plant operators to steal credentials, so-called spear phishing attacks, rather than actually breaking password cryptography. In general, embedded systems and especially industrial controls are targets for the bad guys. Sometimes, folks who build industrial controls say they don't have a problem with security because the bad guys are after credit card numbers and industrial controls don't deal with credit card data. Unfortunately, as we've seen, the bad guys might be after causing physical damage, and so they're motivated to attack industrial control systems. The question is, how would they know what to attack, and how bad is the problem? There's a search engine called Shodan that keeps continually updated maps of all the industrial control systems it can find on the internet. As you can see from this map, it finds a lot of them, especially in the eastern U.S. and northern Europe. Shodan also looks for insecure systems that have no password, or perhaps default manufacturer passwords. For example, in 2013, a researcher reported that Shodan found a traffic light control system. If you got the IP address from Shodan, you were in. No login, no password. Have fun and play with the city's traffic lights. Make sure to obey the caution on the screen saying, death may occur. As another example, Shodan found a hydroelectric plant in France. There's a big red button that lets you shut down the turbine. Again, no password and no login required. These are just a few examples. And even today, a search on Shodan turns up numerous insecure embedded systems. The moral of this story is that if you connect a system to the internet, someone is watching. And they'll find you pretty quickly if you don't even bother to put a good password on your system. Clearly, it's going to be more important to design for security as systems are connected to networks. Some developers think that all you need to do is a bit of security testing, often called penetration testing, and you're done. But that's not enough. To begin with, bad code is inherently vulnerable, and no amount of testing will convert bad code into good secure code. As we saw earlier, buffer overflows are a very common way to attack systems. Well, buffer overflows are simply bad coding style. There's no excuse for buffer overflows, and yet they're all over the place. So bad code is the first problem. Beyond bad code, even if you have good security testing, that testing generally emphasizes finding known security problems to make sure they're patched. Looking for patches is great, but that leaves open all the problems that nobody has found yet, or at least not issued patches for yet. It turns out there's a robust market for finding new security vulnerabilities. There are significant financial incentives, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for reporting a new vulnerability. That means people will be looking for problems. If the bad guys get the problems first, you're vulnerable. But even if the good guys get the problems first and issue a patch, the bad guys then reverse engineer the patch to find the point of attack and start attacking all the unpatched systems. Therefore, you need to deploy patches as soon as you can and have good quality code to minimize the number of vulnerabilities that turn up that the good guys don't know about or that there's no patches for. At the big picture level, security plans involve four big areas. Addressing security requirements, in other words, what does secure mean to you? Characterizing risks and threats. Having a security risk management plan so that you can spend your limited security resources addressing the most important risks. And finally, deploying security patches. There are myriad technical issues beyond that. But the point is, you have to pay attention to security, and you have to do security in an end-to-end -end way, starting with a secure design right up front. Testing security into a system after it's built does not work. At this point, we've seen that embedded software has to be high quality, has to be safe, and has to be secure. Perhaps the most common question we get is, well, I have this existing code that is basically bad software. 
what should I do to fix it? The most important point is that to fix things, you need to get out of the never-ending test fix cycle. Finding bugs and fixing bugs makes bad software less bad, but can never make bad software somehow into good software. You cannot test quality into software, you cannot test safety into software, and you cannot test security into software. In an ideal world, you just throw away bad code and start with a clean sheet of paper. And we recommend doing that if you can. But in the real world, we all know what it takes for that to happen most times. While a do-over for all your software is ideal, you often do not have the luxury of a clean slate new design. That means you have to find the parts that really need the most help and re-engineer them to bake the quality into at least those parts. Generally, this involves identifying the highest risk modules, such as ones that perform mission-critical functions or modules with high historical defect rates. Then, re-engineer those modules to improve their quality, including requirements, design, implementation, reviews, and testing. It is tempting to start re-engineering from existing code, then back out design and requirement documents. The hope is that the code is mostly good, and seeing the design backed out from the code will make it obvious what the problem is. We've seen that pretty much never works. Think about it. If what you have is spaghetti code, then backing out a design from spaghetti code just gives you a spaghetti design. That doesn't help anyone. So instead, usually what you should do is re-implement risky modules from scratch using a good design process, beginning quality as you go, then integrate those modules into the bigger system. That's usually the cheapest, smartest way to improve software if you're not able to do a complete do-over. Ultimately, getting better software requires cultural change. Consider, if you redesign your software using the same development process, you shouldn't expect the result to be a whole lot better than what you have now. Just being careful isn't enough. You need to use a better process as well. Change requires a commitment to good software at all levels of the organization, and it's very likely to result in process changes and, commonly, skill upgrades as well. The big test for you is going to be whether that commitment survives the next deadline crisis. Do you actually ship next week on time despite there being too many bugs? Or do you make the hard call and either delay shipment or reduce the feature set to make sure you're only delivering good quality software even if it doesn't meet the particular deadline date? Let's go back up to the top level and consider the types of things that we tend to see when a team is struggling to produce good embedded software. Here's a top 10 list. Number one, software time estimates are driven by external dates instead of an honest appraisal of how long it will take to create high quality software. Number two, process steps are skipped during schedule crunches. Number three, Software development is simply coding plus testing and doesn't involve the rest of a good design process. Number four, poor traceability from product test to requirements, so the requirements don't match up with the tests. Number five, bugs due to poor code style and spaghetti code complexity. Number six, bugs in software fault detection and recovery. Exceptions just aren't handled well. Number seven, no security plan, no safety plan. Number eight, the tester to developer ratio is too far away from about one tester for each developer. Number nine, more than about five to 10% of bugs are found in product test, which means that too many bugs are getting through the rest of the design process. And number 10, Fewer than half the defects are being found by peer review. Fixing these types of problems requires setting forth on a journey to good software. That takes capable people, robust development processes, and use of best practice development techniques. 
Once you've achieved cultural change to embrace these areas, you can expect to get baked-in software quality. Here are the big ideas for getting software quality, safety, and security right. Software is crucial for providing value to your products. But even a single line of bad code can kill a product, harm a company's reputation, or potentially even kill people. That means writing software for embedded systems is a high-stakes profession. Make sure your organization takes it seriously. Good software requires good process, plus good technology, plus good people. And good embedded software requires additional unique technical approaches. Remember that you cannot test quality, safety, or security into software. You have to bake it in from the start using good software development approaches. A key idea is that good process enables a team to create good software. It doesn't matter if you're V or Agile or something else. You cannot skip steps if you want good software. Typically, following a good process for ordinary but mission critical embedded code requires a one to one headcount for testers and developers. Additionally, we found that if your peer reviews are finding less than 50% of your defects, something's broken. Peer reviews are the most cost-effective investment you can make in code quality. So if you're not doing them, ask yourself, why not? Improving software and security are essential. Don't wait until you have a loss event. Get started on it now and get ahead of the game. Most embedded software is safety critical or mission critical one way or another. So that means this applies to you. And these days, security is required as well. So what happens next? The first step should be to assess where you are. How good is your code quality? How good are your software, process, and technical skills? How good are your safety and security practices? Next, create a plan to improve your process, skills, and technology. Ensure that you're doing effective peer reviews. Formalize and follow a reasonable software process. Adapt or adopt relevant safety and security standards. Ensure developers have strong embedded software and process skills. Longer term, most likely, you'll find out that cultural change is the most important part of improving software quality. Make sure that software quality is a first-class company goal, not a sideline. Accomplishing this will require changing your daily practices and ensuring robust support for process improvement. You'll probably also find that you can benefit from training in both process and technical skills as well as instituting a few carefully considered metrics that track your improvement at a deep level without being sidetracked by superficial or short-term measures.